Well, good morning. I'm Keith Thompson, lead pastor here. I want to say welcome. Thank you for being with us uh, today. On this weekend, we want to just take a moment to ask that all of you who have served our country, that you are a veteran, would you please stand so we could honor you and say thank you for your service to our country. Uh, thank you so much. We certainly appreciate you. We appreciate your families as well. And I, did, I just want to pray God's blessing on you and on those that are currently serving our country. Our Heavenly Father, we do pause on this day. Uh, throughout this weekend, we've been thinking of our vets, Lord, those who have served our, our nation, those who are currently serving, and their families. Father, we pray your blessing upon them. We pray for protection for those who are, are serving right now and their families as they're away from home. Lord, we pray that, that things would go smoothly for them. Father, we pray for all those who have served our country. Lord, there are some that uh, have effects of that yet today that are maybe negative. I pray for healing in their hearts and their minds. Lord, I, I just pray that you would bless them. And we thank you for them and them allowing us to live in this country and to enjoy the freedoms that we have. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. That's one of the things I wish I maybe would have done in life is to have been uh, in the military, but uh, back in that day I had asthma, so they wouldn't even let me be in the military uh, back then, but again, thank you for serving our country. Um, how many of you have ever had to make a decision and you thought to yourself, what's God's will? What's God's will? What does God want me to do with this decision? How do we know what God's will is for our lives? Well, today we're beginning a series on what's God's will. And uh, the, the struggle I have this morning, to be honest with you, is that I want to give everything to you today. There's so much good stuff I've been studying and putting together for this series that I'm like, just like a fire hose, just like, let's just give it all today. But I know that'd be too much, and so we're going to give this over the next few weeks. And I think it's just going to be a great blessing to you in how to discover what is God's will for your life? If you're a person that likes to take notes, you will find in your bulletin there's an insert that you can fill in the blanks. If you miss any of those, we will get those to you uh, afterwards. So for me in life, it was maybe like, should I play football or should I run cross country? Or some maybe, should I be in band or should I be in choir? And as you get older, should I go to college or should I just go straight to the workforce? Okay, well, I'm going to go to college. So if I'm going to college, what college do I go to? And what am I going to study? Should I study this or should I study that? And when I get out of college, the question arises, should I take this job with this company or with that company? Should I stay here? Should I move there? Some guy goes and asks a girl out, and the girl says, hmm, should I go out with him? What's God's will? Well, he's kind of cute. Uh, then later on, after it's been going out, well, he, now he wants to marry me. Should I marry this guy or not? And so she marries him. And now it's, well, should we have kids now or should we wait a while? Should we have two kids or should we have 15 kids? Some of you are leaning more towards the two, right? <laughs> should we buy a house? Should we rent? Should we get this car or that car? Should we go to this church? Should we become members of this church? And the questions go on and on. How do we know? How many of you get exhausted by making decisions? Some of you just love it. Some of you get stressed out with decision after decision that needs to be made. Now, if you're like me, maybe you've played some games. God, if it's your will, make this happen. You're driving down the road and you're approaching a stoplight. Lord, if, you're, if it's your will for me to do this, let the stoplight be green and I'll know it's a sign from you. Or Lord, if it's not your will for this to happen, let it turn red. And then you base your decision on what the stoplight is happening to be doing at the time. Anybody done something like that before? There's a few of you that have. Or maybe you've done the pros and the cons. You know, if there's more pros, then maybe God... Uh, wants me to do this. If there's more cons, then maybe it's the evil one who's trying to trip me up. When it comes to the whole marriage thing, is there one right person for everyone who is alive? If there is, that means you've got about a one in three something billion shots of finding that one. 
Think about this. Let's just suppose that it's God's will for you to meet that person here today. And you see that person, and wow, it's, they're pretty good looking, and, and they're in church, and they're carrying a Bible. Well, it, it probably is God's will that I go and I talk to them. But then church has come and gone, and you don't talk to them, and then you think, oh, no, did I now miss it? Will we ever meet again? Is that chance, like, gone? Is it all messed up because I didn't talk to them today? Or if, if there's one right person for everybody... And then someone marries the wrong person, is everything just messed up at that point? It's all thrown off now. What are we going to do? These are questions that we all ask, at least some of these questions we do. What we're going to do today is kind of develop a foundation on which we're going to build in the weeks to come. So how do we know God's will for our life? Now you see behind me I have a hockey net here. Um, go wild and go whoever else you like for hockey, I don't know, but uh, I grew up playing hockey, and so as a hockey player, um, in case you didn't know this, the idea is to take the puck and to get the puck into the net, right? I mean, you can hit the post and it's not a goal, you hit it behind there, it's not a goal, but if you get the puck into the net, you score, and that's what you want to try to do. Now, I, I'm using this to represent God's will for our lives. You see, the first goal post over here, we are going to call this one the, the providential will of God. Again, that sounds like a big word, but don't worry about it. Don't get nervous about it. The providential will of God. Uh, this is the will of God that is going to take place no matter what. There is nothing you can do about this will of God, the providential will of God. Uh, in fact, for example, when God decided it was time to send Jesus Christ into our world, that is the providential will of God. There's nothing that we could have done about that because God had determined that. We weren't going to change his mind. That is his plan. That is the providential will of God. When God decided uh, that it's time for Jesus, when he decides it's time for Jesus to come back for his bride, for the church, that is the providential will of God. This will happen whether you like it or not. This will happen whether you're ready or not. It's the providential will of God. Nothing we can do is going to change that at all. If you believe it, if you don't believe it, if you pray for it, if you pray against it, it's the providential will of God and it will happen no matter what. We see a lot of that recorded in Scripture. On this side over here, we are going to call this the moral will of God. Again, the moral will of God. That one might be uh, easier to understand. For example, would it be right morally for, and I could pick a number of things, but okay, sex outside of marriage. Is it here or is it here? Well, according to Scripture, Scripture says it's over here. It's outside of the moral will of God for our lives. Or, or lying. Okay, should I, I'm going to lie on my taxes. Is that inside the moral will of God for me? Or is that outside of the moral will of God for me? And we can see lots of things listed in Scripture. Now, God is more interested with our character than really with the things that we do. He cares about the things we do. But morally, he wants our character to be living inside the will of God. Now, in addition to the providential will of God and the moral will of God, we have the personal will of God. What is God's specific will for my life? What you need to understand is God's personal will for my life is, is definitely somewhere between the providential will of God, the will of God that's not going to change, okay? For God so loved the world. And you think, but God, don't love that person. You don't know what they did to me. They bugged me. Please, may they be outside of the will of God. For God so loved the world except for so-and-so, right? Well, we know that's not gonna happen because that's the providential will of God. He loves the entire world. He created each one. And then we have the moral will of God. But somewhere in between all that is the personal will of God for our lives and who we are to be. 
And the better you're able to understand what the providential will of God is, according to his scriptures, the things we know are going to happen or have happened, and the moral will of God, again, according to scripture, what he tells us about, the easier it is to be able to understand and to discern what the personal will of God is for our lives. Uh, Again, you can determine this if, God, do you want me to do this? And as you're reading scripture, you discover, well, oh, that might be outside of this, so I know that it's not a part of this because it's not a part of this as well. So today in building a foundation, what I would like for us to do is to make sure that we are, 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 we are being what the scripture calls us to be and that we are living on the correct side of the moral will of God for our lives. So uh, if you have your Bibles, you can look on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. It says this, it is God's will, all right, so it's God's will that that you should be sanctified. Well, what does the word sanctified mean? It it comes from a Greek word which means purification. If you were taking note, it means the state of purity. It means without impurity or pollution. What is God's will? It is God's will that we should be sanctified. Sanctified that we should live on the correct side of the moral will of God for our lives. Some of us might think, well, that's kind of restrictive, and I could have a bigger goal. I could have brought the soccer net in from from out the side there, but that's just a little bit too big to have on the platform. So this is not restrictive. This is really the best place to be in our lives, within the will of God, the providential will of God, the moral will of God, and then we discover the personal will of God. 1 Peter 4, verse 2 and 3 says, as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Now, let's just be honest for a minute. Sometimes being outside the moral will of God for our lives can be fun. In fact, sometimes sinning can be incredibly fun, can't it? Seriously, don't get churchy on me now, all right? (laughs) All right? The Bible says this. There is pleasure in sin. It does say that. It can be fun. It's also incredibly dangerous because it says that pleasure is for a season. So we, we can get outside the moral will of God and say, well, I, I'm happy. This is going great. This is wonderful. This is fun. It must be the will of God for me. Well, it depends on what Scripture says. If we're going against Scripture, even though it's fun for a season, it's going to come a time in our life where it's going to begin to turn around And our life is gonna find destruction because of those choices that we're making that are outside of the moral will of God for our lives. I heard the story of a a guy whose next door neighbor had a car that he always parked in front of this guy's house. And this guy would tell his neighbor, hey, stop, stop doing that. It's not that he couldn't, it just kind of bugged the neighbor that it was always in front of his house he would park. And the guy would just keep doing that. He's like, hey, stop doing that. Keep doing it. Stop doing that. Keep doing that. Well, finally, one day, this neighbor left his car parked there with his windows rolled down. And this guy went, and he just decided he was going to turn on his water, his sprinkler, and water the guy's car, the inside of the car. Was that fun? Yes, it was. (laughs) It wasn't me, by the way, okay? (laughs) But (laughs) it, it could be fun. It could be fun. Was it wrong? Yes, it was. Now, some of you are debating that, whether it was wrong or not. It's wrong. It's not how God wants us to treat our neighbors. So, but sin can be fun and wrong. So sin is like it's fun for a while, and then it gets messy. Some people today are living outside the boundaries of the moral will of God and are wondering, why is my life not working better than this? Why is everything just falling apart? Well, it's fun for a while, but it's the most dangerous place you can live. What is God's will? 
start with the basics. It's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you should be inside his, his boundaries, right? Inside of this is where you want to be. So today, we're going to deal with, um, with sin. And there's two types of sin, if you're taking notes. The first one is what theologians would call the sins of commission. These are the sins that we commit. The things that we're not supposed to do, the things that according to Scripture, according to God, are outside of the moral will of God, the things we're not supposed to do, but we end up doing. And Paul asked a question in Romans 6, 1 and 3. He said, Should we, shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? In other words, if I'm going to be forgiven anyway, I might as well sin. And the more I sin, the more God demonstrates his grace. And isn't that a good thing? God's grace will be evident in my life because of how he keeps forgiving me for all the sin I keep on doing. And he asks the question and then he answers it. Shall we go sinning that grace may increase? And then he says, by no means, no way. Why? Because we died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So when Jesus lives in us and the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave is inside of the believer, the Holy Spirit convicts us toward holiness. So when we wander outside of the moral will of God for our lives, the Holy Spirit convicts us to bring us back in to where we ought to be. This is a good thing. This is an incredible thing because if this never happened and I wandered away and I was outside of the will of God, I wasn't living for God at all, I would never have a hope of eternity with God. So when I'm outside of God's will, will, the Holy Spirit draws me back into or into a relationship with Jesus Christ where there's grace, where he forgives us of all of our sins. That is a good thing that he does because of his love for us. So ask yourself this question this morning. What am I doing that's outside of the moral will of God? In other words, what are you doing that you shouldn't be doing? And now some of you, um, maybe real spiritual folks are gonna say, well, bless God, I, I never do anything wrong. <laughs> For you, if you just jot down on your paper a five-letter word called pride, <laughs> right? I never do anything. Well, the Bible says we all do. What are you doing that's outside of God's will? It could be that you're gripped in a very real way with materialistic things. You think, if I just get one more thing, if I just get more money, I'll be happy. Oh, and it would just solve everything for me. And it's got a hold of your heart, and it's gripped your heart. It could be that maybe you have a rebellious attitude. It could be rebelling against your parents. There's just this attitude that has come in. Or rebelling against God. Maybe it could just be something as easy as, you're just negative. You, you, could, you can pick everything apart and you do it so well. You're really good at it. But it's probably a talent you ought to just let go, all right? <laughs> what is it that you're doing that you're not supposed to be doing? Now some of you might say, well I, I, I really, I don't know. I don't know. And if that's where you are, uh, maybe this is what could have happened to you. How many have ever walked into a dark room and you just can't see a thing? And you're like, you're stumbling around, you're trying to feel your way around, you're, you're kicking your toes on something that's low and you're bumping your hip into something and it's like, wow, this is really dark, I can't see where I'm going. But after a while, what do your eyes begin to do? They begin to adjust. You begin to see a little bit in the darkness. And you've been in there so long that your eyes have adjusted. What happens if you were to leave that room and go outside? You can't see anything again, right? You're, it's like you're, you're blinded. And, and, and sometimes uh, we get like that. Uh, we're outside of the moral will of God for so long that our eyes simply adjusted to the darkness, to the lifestyle that we've been in for such a long time that we, 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 maybe we've never experienced the light or else we've, we've left God and we've gotten into the darkness and we forgot what it was like 
to actually walk in that light with Christ. I want to encourage you just to let the Holy Spirit just break your heart over maybe what's been going on in your life. And, and some of you are like, man, I, it's been a long time. I just, I don't know if I can change or I've tried to change. Friends, the Holy Spirit will help you. He will convict us of sin. He will draw us back into a loving relationship with Jesus. So don't just let the devil say, well, you've been doing this so long that you're never gonna change. There's no hope for you. Oh, there is, friends. There's hope because God will draw you back into where he wants you to be. The second question that we're going to deal with uh, deals with the sin of omission. Write that down, the sin of omission. The things that we should be doing that we are not doing. So James 4, 17 talks about that. The Bible says, anyone then who knows the good that he ought to do, but doesn't do it, say it out loud, sins. So anyone who knows the good that he or she shouldn't do, or should do, but doesn't do it, they sin. So what are you not doing that God wants you to do? Maybe there's something that God has called you to do, and you've been unwilling to do that so far. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna look at characters of the scripture that were just like this. I mean, there's people that ran, that got swallowed by large fish, that all this kind of stuff, all because of the will of God, and not maybe wanting to do what God wanted for their life. You know, sometimes it can be humorous when people argue with God. You ever heard somebody say, you know, I, I feel like God is, I'm, I'm supposed to maybe go and I'm supposed to bring this over to that person who just had surgery, but I, I just, I, re, I really don't know. Friends, the devil is not gonna tell you to do that. I guarantee you, he's never gonna tell you to do something nice for somebody else. And so if, if, if you have that stirring in your heart, that's God's will for you. And then if, if God is, is pointing you in that direction to do that, and then we don't do it, again, that's sin. So sometimes we think sin is just the things that we do that are outside of the moral will of God. But sometimes it can be what God asks us to do and we don't go and do that. And there's a number of reasons for why we maybe don't do that. Maybe you're supposed to give something to someone who's in need or maybe you're supposed to honor God with good stewardship and, and worship him with tithes. You're out... Uh, uh, you're out here just, you're kind of dying financially and you're wondering why is that happening? And you're not even giving generously to God and giving him something to bless. Or maybe you're supposed to get involved in, in the church and, and, and be a biblical functioning part of the body of Christ and God's called you to do something and maybe you said, no, I just don't want to do that. Again, he who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, the Bible says that's sin. And we don't want to live outside of the moral will of God. Again, all these things will help us to find that personal will of God. What does God have for my life? Maybe you have gifts you're supposed to use to serve him, to do something for somebody else. Maybe God's asking you to read through the Bible this year, or even just to, hey, I want you to have devotions five days a week. Let's see if that's a big goal. Now, just for five minutes, you can do this, okay? And he's stirring you to do that. Maybe you're supposed to be in a life group or lead a life group or, or start a ministry. Or maybe God has put this vision on your heart for, for some business venture. And, and God's planted that dream in your heart, and yet there's, there's things that have held you back. There's fear, there's doubt, there's whatever. The Bible says, he who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sin. So sometimes God is calling us to do something. As we see in scripture over and over again, people call to do something from Moses to you name them, and they're always excuses, right? And they process through that, and that's okay. It's okay to process through that. But we want to get to that place where when God stirs our heart, we become obedient to what he's asking us to do. Some of you maybe have wandered so far outside of the will of God. You're thinking to yourself, there is no way. There's no way that I can ever even make a step towards the will of God for my life. Uh, how many back in like the 70s and 80s you like to play some video games or these amazing games like Pac-Man? Anybody ever play Pac-Man? Some of you are like, what is Pac-Man, right? Um, Donkey Kong, Space Invaders. Well... <laughs> There, there was, there was a, a game years ago called, um, I think, Asteroids. How many remember the game Asteroids, all right? 
You know, you're just, you're moving these rolling things, and you're hitting the buttons as crazy as you can and stuff, and trying to shoot these things. There was times playing that game when you were just in trouble. It's like, this doesn't look good for me. I'm about to die in this game. But there was a button. There was a button that was called a hyperspace button, where it would automatically transport you from where you were at to a new safe place where you could begin kind of again. Uh, God doesn't have a hyperspace button, but he has a hyper grace button a hyper grace button, that when you find that you're so far outside of the will of God, that you've been doing your own thing, that there's like no way I can ever get back to where God wants me to be. The grace of God can bring you from where you're at to where you ought to be at, just like that. That's incredible. It's incredible. The grace of God. God has a plan for each and every one of you. And unless you've stopped breathing five minutes ago or now, God has a plan for you, right? That plan doesn't end until we breathe our last breath. He has a plan for your life. And I don't want know about you, but I desperately want to follow his plan. I think that's the best place for me to be. It may not always be the most comfortable place for me to be. See, some of us determine the will of God by, do I have a peace in my heart? And not that that's bad, but I don't think Moses had peace in his heart when he was going before Pharaoh. I think he was still scared to death. But he knew God's will for his life. And sometimes if we just go by a peace, we won't do some of God's will because sometimes it's hard. And sometimes it's a little bit scary. And sometimes the devil battles us and we're like, oh, I don't have a peace. We can't always go by that. And yet sometimes that's what we need to look for. We'll get into that in weeks to come. Some of you this morning, again, you find yourself outside of here. Whether maybe you've never given your heart to Jesus before. Or maybe as a follower of Christ, there are some things that that you are doing that you shouldn't be doing. Or there's some things that you should be doing that you're not. The grace of God brings us back into the will of God in a moment. And this morning, I would like to invite you to to bow your heads, if you would, to close your eyes. And just for the parents to know, in just a few moments, we will be having the kids come back in. Uh, We want to close our service by just praying for Pastor Rachel and Tyler and gather on them and, and bless them this morning. But this morning, maybe as you're sitting here, you're thinking, you know what, I I have never given my life to Jesus. And I, I need to do that. God created you so he could be in relationship with you. And our sin separates us from him because God is holy, because God is pure, he is without sin. And the Bible says every single one of us have sinned. So God had a solution to that problem and he sent Jesus Christ, his son, who lived a life without sin, who died on the cross, but he was raised from the grave three days later. And because of that, you and I can have a relationship with him you and I can enjoy the blessings of walking inside the will of God for our lives. And coming from from outside the will of God where things are are, are just messy and there's destruction, and I'm not saying there's perfection when you become a Christian, everything is hunky-dory. There's still issues, but you're in relationship with God who's gonna make a way, who's gonna do miracles, who's gonna provide, who's gonna help you through that. And this morning, if you need to give your life to Jesus Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in just a moment. I'm not going to call you forward and say, hey, here's so-and-so giving a heart to Jesus. I just want to know if there's anyone here this morning that I can pray with you, and I'm just going to lead you in a simple prayer of of inviting uh, yourself to give your heart to Jesus, inviting Jesus Christ into your life. So if that's you this morning right now, would you just raise up your hand real high? You want to invite Jesus Christ into your heart. You want to come inside relationship with him and his will for your life. Anyone here this morning? Yes, thank you. Is there anyone else this morning? I want to say yes to Jesus. You can put your hands down if you have it up. Anyone else this morning? Just going to wait a moment longer. Can we pray this prayer together? Would you join me? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for loving me and sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for me. 
I confess that I have sinned. I now invite you to come into my heart. Forgive me of all my sin. And help me to live a life that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, uh, Mike and Irene, a wonderful couple from our church, just want to meet you right down here by the speaker. We have a gift we'd like to give you that's going to help you grow in your faith. Now for some of you this morning, you're a follower of Christ, but maybe there's an area that you're struggling with. I just want to pray for you that God would help you to, uh, to be able to resist temptation. As he says, with every temptation, there is a way of escape. Every single temptation has a way out. And as we draw unto Jesus, the devil, he will have to flee. That's what scripture says. We know that's the truth. And so I want to encourage you this morning, if there's something in your life that you know is outside of the will of God for you, as a believer, today's a day for you to make that right, for you to surrender that and to, and to resist that and to cling unto Jesus. Or maybe God's calling you to do something and maybe something's held you back, fear, doubt, worry, whatever. And he's saying today's the day that you need to start taking that step of faith and believing that I can do this through you that I can do this through you. And so you are gonna start doing what God has called you to do. Uh, I just want you right now in your heart just to let the Holy Spirit search you on that and to make those decisions this morning and to, and to again, hyperspace yourself if you need to, hypergrace yourself back into the will of God for your life. So the next few weeks, we're gonna begin looking at the personal will of God for our lives. How can we discover what's God's will for me? So. Uh, we want to end the service this morning by having Pastor Rachel and Tyler, if you guys want to just come on up here. Uh, we, we love you guys so much and have been so blessed uh, to have you here. Rachel, a little longer than Tyler, but Tyler's been a part of the team for a number of months as well. And uh, I, I know that God has some incredible things planned for your life as you are in ministry together. And uh, I know your heart is a deaf ministry. and We look forward to just seeing how God uses you guys as a team. Uh, we have been so blessed by both of you here. Uh, certainly are going to miss you. Uh, we all will have a time of adjustment, and uh, we'll get through this together, so we'll need your help for that. Um, but we are praying that God would bless you guys. And if you didn't know, Pastor Rachel is going to be uh, nannying uh, for her sister uh, and her, her niece, uh, nephews, two nephews. And... Uh, and then I, I believe it'll be uh, not too long and you guys will be some, in some church and ministry. And so we'll be praying for you guys regarding that as well. So uh, I want to invite you, if you would, uh, to stand. Some of you will want to gather around Pastor Rachel and Tyler as we pray for God's blessing. Kids, why don't you kids come on up first? Gather the kids all in. Come on up around them. Surround them, kids. Let's surround them. <clears throat> and after the kids come, if the kids at heart want to come as well, <laughs> All right. Would you please just, if you're still in the, in the chair there, if you would just extend your hand towards them. We want to pray God's blessing on them today. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of, of pastors. We're called to, to shepherd and to love on the sheep. And Lord, we thank you for Pastor Rachel and Tyler who have loved on the, the youngest of our sheep in this church who have modeled a, a, a walk with Christ in an incredible way, whose heart is always filled with excitement for your word and to be able to share that word with passion uh, with our children. We thank you for the things our kids have learned through their ministry. We thank you for the seeds that have been planted that we know they will not return void. Lord, we know that we are going to miss them. But Lord, as we've talked about this morning, we, we thank you for the, the personal will of God that leads us and guides us. And uh, sometimes doors close and other doors open. And we just pray that you would have them to always have a heart of faith, to, to trust in you through the open doors that you will provide. God, we pray your blessing on them. We pray for many, many years of fruitful ministry wherever you would lead them. And again, we thank you for the blessing they are to us. Father, we pray that you would be with all of the kids whose hearts have been attached to them, 
that you would help them through this process. And Lord, that you would uh, just let them know that everything's going to be okay. And it's okay to miss somebody, and it's okay to be sad during a time, and, and we will be. And Father, we pray that you would even now bless the, the food that we're about to have as we have lunch together and just spend some more time visiting with them and sharing with them and thanking them. Uh, thank you for the hands that prepared it. May it, it just uh, give us nourishment as we serve you this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you help me give Rachel and Tyler a big round of applause? And, uh, amen. Thank you so much. Love you guys.